are fueling the next generation of innovation. Not all computer scientists are equal. Some of us love structure, but some of us also love creativity and style. How do you marry those two things together? That's how you become an open source superhero. It is about sharing knowledge. It is about working together and building a network to help you find that unicorn, to help others find their unicorns. If you do that, you can accelerate the rate and pace at which you innovate. When it comes to open source, we create big, important projects that will change the world and move us forward. Thank you, Jim, for the uh, introduction. Um, the, the video uh, came in in the middle of that and interrupted just for a moment. But I, I do encourage you to stick around uh, through this keynote because Don is going to do a demo a little bit later, a live demo. Uh, and so it'll be well worth how we connect a uh, uh, topic from last year's LinuxCon uh, into blockchain and a, a ex very exciting new technology. So first, looking back at LinuxCon, 2015, uh, Ross Morey stood on stage. Ross Morey is the general manager of uh, System Z at IBM and uh, discussed uh, the Linux One server. Uh, we introduced it and, and, and uh, uh, brought it to market uh, at that conference. It comes in two sizes, Rockhopper, which is a smaller uh, platform, and then Emperor, you know, so the small penguin to the, the largest penguin. And with that, brought to market, being able to scale up Linux at a scale that uh, you know, hadn't been done before versus scale out. But this platform, both scaling up, if you need uh, incredible processing power, memory, I.O. bandwidth, uh, all of that comes inherent in the hardware platform. And then the ability to scale out using virtualization. Uh, virtualization on this platform is actually 41 years old. A lot of people think virtualization is new with VMware. No, there's been various forms of it over the years, but uh, uh, you've got everything from, from the traditional virtualization on the platform through KVM. And KVM brought to the platform uh, both as an open source uh, solution, but also something that people are very familiar with. And so the ability to administer a box using KVM just as if it were an x86 box. And then without risk. Without risk is a couple of things. First is the stability of the platform, designed into the hardware's availability, so you don't need to worry about that at the, the software layer, or the application layer. And the second is security. Also designed for cognitive, and when we talk about cognitive, it's not artificial intelligence, it's really the ability to enhance what we do as, as humans. So how do I take a lot of information distill it down into something that I, I can use. A, a good example, if I'm an oncologist and I want to stay current in my field, I need to read 160 hours a week to stay current. Uh, for those of, you know, just simple math, that leaves eight hours in the week to sleep, to, to go to work, to do whatever else you do. So that's just not physically possible. But I can use cognitive tools that will, I can input you know, patient information, I can uh, do signs, symptoms, and it will go and bring back and say, you know, 90% chance this is what your problem is, this is what you're looking at, and, and link me to those resources to where I can investigate it. That's just a, a very pragmatic uh, example of how cognitive can enhance what we're doing uh, in the world. Uh, collaboration, and that's kind of the key uh, for Linux over all the years and, and open source projects that have come since then, uh, that we find that going beyond the bounds of a company or a project group uh, and, and working uh, as a broader community, you get innovation at a much more rapid pace. Uh, everybody kind of scratches their own itch. And in doing that, uh, uh, we all get the benefit of working together. And then the last piece is, uh, delivering in cloud platform. With, with that, it's how do I uh, virtualize and serve that up uh, at, at the most basic level on premise? And then how do I link back uh, to the, the cloud via hybrid? Three quick uh, client examples. ADS 
is a managed service provider in Mexico. They provide uh, application services to, uh, to both government and, and industry there. And what they found was uh, the ability to consolidate their services on a single frame, running Linux, uh, and serving up uh, applications. They got uh, ease of use in, in management because they weren't scaling beyond uh, thousands of servers. They got consolidation license uh, savings through that, and then just a quality of service that they were able to offer. HX Express is an uh, uh, integrator in China, and uh, one of their key projects that they started with, there are regions in China that still do cash and paper tickets for transportation, whether it's train, uh, buses, uh, even the state highways, and automating that. So they did a quick analysis and said, the easiest way for us to do that is on a rock hopper running Linux and uh, uh, scaling that quickly. And uh, they've, they've done an early pilot, and that transition has gone much better than they uh, had anticipated. The Meta Office does uh, weather for uh, the UK, and both for government and aviation uh, and, and private sector. They take uh, 10 million data points daily on weather and then run that through a high-performance computing uh, algorithm and then produce uh, products, basically, and services on weather forecasts that help everything from disaster planning, like I say, to aviation and shipping and, and the like. Uh, they had been running that in a completely scale-out uh, environment and evaluated doing an emperor and putting all, that all in one frame. They had planned three months to do that transition. It took three weeks. Um, and I, I think a, a key thing and, and something that we've heard on the sh uh, expo floor is people are like, so what's Linux like on, on a big system? It's just Linux. So we had uh, an open source database partner port to the platform. Uh, we asked, what do you want for the distro? They said Red Hat 7.1. But Red Hat 7.1, they logged in and they said, but this is just Linux. It's the same kernel, same GCC. I said, yeah. 20 minutes later, they had their application up and running, and they were spending time then optimizing for the platform. So with the, the explosion of data uh, and, and uh, Internet of Things and the ability to measure so many different things, uh, this is really creating a, a transformation uh, in the digital world. Uh, a couple of things that, that come to mind for me. Um, everything from the medical office where, uh, if you go back enough in time, if I got a prescription for a doc from a doctor, it was in their writing, you'd hand it to the pharmacist, the pharmacist couldn't read it, so they'd say, would you go to see the doctor about? I'd say, I had a cold, or I had this infection, and they would know which, which drug to give you. Uh, not the best, most reliable method. Now, I, I go to the doctor's office, they're inputting into a keyboard exactly what's going on. By the time I go to the pharmacist, they're actually getting it in digital format. Uh, so uh, it improves the quality of service. Um, I've already talked a little bit about by doing things in an open way. I mean, we had Microsoft on stage, uh, uh, pretty phenomenal that over the years, that transformation has happened to see that the benefit of working within communities and uh, uh, the broader scope uh, is, is very important uh, to business. And then the last quote, uh, Dr. Ramirez actually used that one yesterday. So uh, uh, it does come that, that there's great power that you can do both in scaling out and, and scale up systems. And so with that, it's really important uh, to, to protect that, whether it's through security, uh, data privacy, uh, and the like. And finally, before uh, I hand over to Donna, um, over the years, IBM's first foray into open source was actually the Apache Software Foundation, working with uh, the web server there and uh, folding that into the WebSphere product. And then shortly after that, uh, Dan Fry uh, created the Linux Technology Center. IBM uh, evaluated Linux and said, this is really the direction we think the world is going, and started participating in the late 90s 
uh, in the Linux uh, kernel project. Over the years, we've added to that, um, whether it's Eclipse or OpenStack and joining those communities, most recently the Open Container Initiative uh, to help uh, drive some commonality and some standards there. Uh, the Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation is another good example. Uh, Node.js. And then most recently, the Hyperledger project uh, kicked off last year through the Linux Foundation. Very exciting. So uh, at this time, I'd like to hand over the microphone to uh, Dr. Donna Dillenberger from IBM. So what is Hyperledger? Hyperledger is an open source blockchain project from the Linux Foundation. And what is blockchain? Blockchain is just software that replicates data across organizations. So before blockchain, uh, different groups would share their data and when they shared their data and assets, they would keep a record of that in their own internal databases. Blockchain is software that provides a ledger um, in the different companies, and when a company puts a record on the blockchain ledger, their own blockchain ledger, then the blockchain software replicates that across all the other participants in the blockchain network. It does that in a way that enables the data to be um, tamper-proof, and it can't be deleted. Uh, the best way to show you what the blockchain, uh, what blockchain does is just to show you a demo. So now we'll show the demo. All right. So IBM uses blockchain for our own, um, for our own uh, supply chain. So what you see here is that IBM builds computers. And we have 4,000 suppliers and partners all over the world that's sending us parts to uh, build computers. And that, um, that causes us to have 25,000 disputes every year. So they say that uh, they sent IBM an invoice. IBM says, we never got your invoice. Uh, they say that they ship the parts. IBM says we never received the parts. We say that uh, IBM gave you a payment, and the 4,000 partners and, um, and suppliers says they never got, uh, they never got uh, the payment. So now we're asking all of our partners worldwide uh, to use our blockchain. And um, so approximately every year we have $100 million tied up in our supply chain. It takes us 44 days to resolve a dispute and every dispute is about $31,000. So with this blockchain, uh, we're asking our partners, uh, put a record of your invoice on the blockchain, and IBM will put a record when we receive the invoice, put a record when you've shipped the parts on the blockchain, and uh, IBM will put a record we have the parts. And um, uh, what this does is it allows partners and suppliers to look up in their own blockchain the status of any parts or supplies that they've, uh, they've uh, shipped to IBM. And it's cut down the amount of time that it takes to resolve a dispute. Instead of calling a person at the other end, some, some call center, they could just go to the blockchain and look uh, to see whether the invoice was received or approved or whether the payment is coming. So let me show you a live blockchain. So this is a, this is a map of the US. And we have partners and suppliers all over the world, but this is just our US one. Uh, when I click on this, it makes a call to the blockchain, and that REST API um, gets this data. So these are partners. This is real data. Since it's a, it's a public demo, I can't show the, the IDs of our partners, but uh, they all have unique IDs. For example, partner 718 sent us invoices last year from July through December, totaling 39,000 invoices, $186 million. So again, this, all this data is on the blockchain, and just to see it live, right, uh, what we see is across the top, you see invoices coming in, uh, one for $82,000, another one for $163. We're getting, um, we're getting invoices and payments um, uh, across the country. This is a blockchain, so green is the invoice was approved, red means it was rejected, and white means that uh, the invoice was received. So that's the live demo of the blockchain. Now I'll just go back to the slides. And when we go back to the slides, uh, a, a company that's using the Hyperledger blockchain is Everledger. 
right? Everledger provides provenance of high value items. So one of the items that they're providing provenance on is diamonds. So again, the whole network of, of diamonds, um, that's being uh, put on the blockchain. So what that is is uh, when a diamond is shipped from a conflict-free mine, that pedigree is gonna go on the blockchain. When that diamond is polished by the, these companies, their certification is gonna go on the blockchain. When those diamonds are traded in Antwerp, the traders will put their certification on the blockchain. And again, this is just one of the many test cases that we're using um, uh, that uh, blockchain is being used for. So wh why are they using the Linux Foundation Hyperledger blockchain? Um, unlike uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is the com is, um, started the blockchain protocol, but the, the Bitcoin's use of blockchain is what we call a public anonymous blockchain. So that means if you download a blockchain database from Bitcoin, uh, you can see all the transactions that are occurring in Bitcoin. So you could see all the wallet IDs that are transferring Bitcoin. But a lot of the companies that we're working with, they said that they uh, want some additional features to blockchain. So for example, with the, exam with, the, um, uh, with the provenance of diamonds, they wanted to be able to say, if you, if you download the, uh, the Hyperledger blockchain database, they want to have that data encrypted. They want to make sure that some of the records are private. They also want to be able to set permissions on who could see the value of these diamonds, and we call that a permission blockchain. So besides encryption and permission, they also wanted to be able to have every record on the blockchain signed so that we know that it's, it's this bank that put that record on the blockchain. We know that it's this diamond mine that put this record on the blockchain. So you could still configure Hyperledger to be anonymous, but you could also configure it so that every record on the blockchain is digitally signed so you know who put that data there. You could still make the Hyperledger blockchain public, but you also have the option of configuring it uh, to have the data encrypted so that the data is protected. And uh, you could still have anyone uh, see the data on the Hyperledger blockchain, but there's also an option so that you could also um, set permission on um, what, uh, uh, what other entities could see the blockchain. So um, last year, the Hyperledger blockchain didn't exist. Uh, last year, many companies worked with you know, Bitcoin derivative blockchains, you know, other blockchains like Ethereum or Ripple or Chain or something like that. But when we started working with companies uh, with these other blockchain implementations, they asked for these three additional features. They wanted the data to be encrypted, they wanted the data to have access permissions associated with it, and they wanted the data to be signed, digitally signed, so we know where the data is coming from. These three differences are the differences of the Hyperledger Linux Foundation blockchain. So um, uh, the other thing that uh, we have is that um, IBM has stood up a cloud uh, to provide these Hyperledger, Hyperledger blockchain services. So when we come to uh, use cases such as uh, the provenance of diamonds, we know that this is going to be a high value blockchain that uh, has to be uh, extremely secure. And there's going, to be a, um, there's going to be a talk at, uh, at lunch from 1 to 2 o'clock. And I'll be uh, showing you the, uh, the IBM uh, cloud for blockchain then and what are the unique features that it has that provides security to blockchain. Uh, so now I'll invite Jim back. Thank you. So uh, as a lot of people might not have access to a Linux one, uh, in order to try out either an application or some uh, uh, program that you've been working on, we have a, a, a Linux one community cloud that has a 120 day free trial uh, for you to give it a try. So if you can't remember this URL, type in Linux one trial and uh, it'll be the top hit in whatever your favorite uh, search engine is. All right, uh, just last thing here is, uh, as Donna just mentioned, uh, Lunch and Learn back here at one o'clock, so I highly encourage you to come. Uh, we'll go into a lot more depth and, and have some great technical discussion there. Uh, it'll also include uh, a new partner of ours, uh, Cognition Foundry, so uh, I would encourage you to come. Second is stop by the booth. If I mentioned Linux One, uh, there's a, the plexiglass lit up display version of it there. Stop in, 
bring problems, bring questions, uh, uh, comments, uh, we welcome those. And then the last thing is feel free to, to see some hands-on demos and meet our experts. So with that, I'll invite Jim Zimlin back on stage. Thank you.